Um, we're going to have two panel discussions back to back. The first one is going to focus on democracy, human rights, security in Georgia's neighborhood. What are some of the challenges that are faced here? And we have an excellent panel lined up for that. Following that, we will go directly to our panel on Russia. And uh, I think that will be a very stimulating discussion as well. Immediately after the Russia conversation, um, Ian Brzezinski, who is moderating that, will then moderate a video conversation with the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Rose Gottemuller. Uh, so that will be the final lineup of what we have for our conference here. To get us started on the issues in Georgia's neighborhood, we have an excellent moderator from the Brookings Institution, good friend. Let me turn it over to Jamie Kirchett. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I'm here filling in for my friend Michael Weiss, who had to cancel at the last minute, so you'll have to see me again. Um, I just wanted to underline what both Kurt and Peter said earlier today, which is that uh, on the importance of values in foreign policy, and that's really ultimately the reason why we're here in Georgia. I mean, there's a reason why we're doing this conference in Georgia and not, say, other countries in this region, uh, because Georgia has made a commitment to democracy, democratic values. Um, there's a reason why Georgia has the relationship that it does with the EU, with the United States, why it's even in these processes with the EU and NATO. And that's what distinguishes Georgia really from the other countries in the region. Uh, and so that's something obviously that Georgia should be applauded for um, and something to keep in mind as we, as we continue these, these conversations. Um, so this discussion today uh, is about democracy, human rights, and security. And often when we talk about foreign policy, um, these values or these, these interests are uh, defined as being sometimes mutually exclusive. That you have sort of the human rights basket on one side, and then you have the security basket on the other. Uh, and that the United States has to pursue um, certain policies with different countries, where some countries our relationships are determined almost entirely by security concerns and we don't talk about human rights at all or very little um, and we talk about human rights more with other countries that perhaps aren't as perceived as being as important uh, in terms of national security. So this is the opening question I want to ask all three of our panelists starting with uh, Tom Melia who worked on these issues um, for many years in the NGO sector and then was in the State Department working on them. Is that even the correct frame? Should we look at these you know, human rights and security, are they mutually exclusive or are they really connected to each other? Well, thanks, Jamie. And I just want to say a quick word of thanks to Nino and the EPRC for the hospitality these last couple days and to Kurt and the McCain Institute for inviting this uh, political refugee from the Obama administration to be part of this conversation this week. Um, I think that reflects the kind of bi bipartisan consensus in U.S. foreign policy on some aspects of our policies and our, our place in the world. Um, and the intense interest that has been shown by Americans as well as Europeans here in Georgia uh, could, only, could only be enlarged a hundredfold if Georgia could fix just one thing. Just before this panel, I was handed this little tag that says that I have to get up and I have to be out the door tomorrow morning to catch my airplane by 4 a.m. Now, if you had humane air travel <laughs> in and out of Georgia, you would have many more tourists, many more think tanks, many more business people coming here. This is a major obstacle to Georgian integration. The American ambassadors. <laughs> may, may, may I come in with that? Then you have to fly, yeah, this is the, the, the commercial now. Take Georgian Airways. Take Georgian Airways. They have the civilized hour. Uh, I thought you were off. going to say Lufthansa, but OK. No, no, no Lufthansa. All right. So um, anyway, so uh, there's, there's a lot of consensus on that also. So um, as to the question of the hour, uh, the, the panel is framed as democracy, human rights, and security getting the balance right. And that suggests that there's trade-offs, that if you have too much democracy, you might be less secure. If you have too much uh, security, you might be less democratic. And I just think that's the wrong way to frame it. Um, and Georgia is a perfect illustration of this, that the more democratic a place becomes, the more rights are respected, uh, more other good things come with that. Uh, Ed Chow yesterday in the discussion about uh, energy security 
talked about the importance of rule of law in attracting energy investments into a country and a region. And I think that's exactly right. A stronger uh, judiciary rule of law system uh, leads to a freer economic environment, more participation, more security of property rights. Uh, so the more democratic and rights respecting a country is, uh, the more prosper it is likely to become. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There, there's not always a uh, developmental disadvantage to dictatorship. Everybody likes to point to Singapore. Singapore thrived and advanced significantly under an authoritarian government for several decades. What are the other countries in that category? There's not too many. Uh, so Singapore is a conspicuous exception to a more general rule, which is that countries that have more rights-respecting democracies, better uh, judicial systems and political openness are more likely to be prosperous and thrive. I think that also applies to the security dimension. And security, of course, can be thought of in multiple dimensions. There's the, the NATO cross-border interstate conflict dimension and how do we guard against that. There's the terrorist threat. There's the threats of uh, secession and uh, revolution and uh, unhappy populations within a country. And then there's uh, security in the streets, uh, law and order, policing. So there's multiple dimensions of security, but I think the world's experience is that the countries that are more democratic tend to be more politically stable, tend to be more secure in all those dimensions uh, because democratic systems are more uh, flexible and dynamic and open to considering policy options. When something doesn't work in policing or in uh, addressing an angry, unhappy minority or in addressing a neighboring country's complaints, open societies have ways to talk about things and consider options. Uh, they have think tanks, they have opposition parties, they have newspapers. A more open discussion leads to more options and to more ch possibilities for positive change in policies, resolution of disputes without violence. And so I think that um, the answer to the question of getting the balance right is to borrow a, what used to be a common European Union phrase, which is more for more. The more democracy you have, the more security you have. And I think that Georgia is a perfect illustration of that, uh, as it's become, uh, as was said earlier today, a net exporter of security in the region and the world as partnering with NATO and the United States, uh, as it's been more democratic. And so I think uh, um, good things come in threes often, and I think uh, the more democracy a country has, the more prosperity it is likely to have, and certainly the more security it will have and be able to share with its neighbors. Ambassador, um, I want you to answer the general question as well, but with a maybe particular uh, aspect with Turkey, which is obviously a very important member of NATO. And uh, often when there are human rights criticisms made about what's happening in Turkey, uh, the Turkish government will sometimes respond that, you know, maybe you shouldn't say these things because we're in NATO and you wouldn't want to jeopardize the security relationship that, that we have. Um, is that a fair characterization? And, and what is the Turkish perspective on this? No, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I mean, I would like to agree with uh, Mr. Melia that I mean, I don't think democracy, human rights, and security are mutually exclusive. On the contrary, they are mutually reinforcing. I think one without the other cannot really flourish in any country. And I think with, in Turkey, we are definitely committed and very much convinced of this fact. But you cannot also ignore that, I mean, the world we are living, as we are, the world in flux is really changing, and we are faced with more and more new and evolving security threats and risks. And of course, every country has to adapt itself into this new security environment. And sometimes you have to take some new measures, which can, uh, in a way, seem to uh, go into the area of human rights and democracy in a way. But I mean, I think you have to see the ultimate objective and the, uh, the whole starting point in that regard. I mean, why are you taking certain these new measures, whether it is just pure security point of view or whether you're trying to protect human rights and democracy by taking certain measures in the interim in order to come to an area period where you can provide more security, more human rights and more democracy to your own uh, citizens as well. So now, of course, I mean, I know that, I mean, uh, within the last two days or so, I have been asked many questions about Turkey, some of them very tough questions with harsh observations, whether Turkey is slipping away from democracy and such. Um, 
I would say, I mean, this is not the case, definitely, because um, first and foremost, I would try to put things in perspective, what is happening in Turkey. First of all, I, mean, I fully understand the question marks. I mean, looking from outside Turkey, it is not easy to understand what is actually happening in Turkey. And I really appreciate those questions and interest, because that is because you care about what you what is happening in Turkey, because Turkey is an important uh, member of the European community of nations, not only a member of NATO and important from a security point of view, but I think from the general, in the terms of the general picture, I think Turkey is important. But let us not forget that, I mean, the present government, first of all, I mean, which is at the center of criticism, you know, I mean, uh, the government led by former Prime Minister and President Erdogan, um, uh, has been in power since 2002 for the last 15 years. And this is the same government, with a few exceptions maybe in the active leadership, which got high praises for their reforms in order to boost the EU membership process, for our you know, courage in starting this peace process with the Kurdish people in Turkey and such. So, and then I think, I think up until 2013 or so, the image of Turkey was quite different from what we see in the Western press nowadays. Uh, and I even particularly remember the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring. When it started, many Western countries, many Western leaders, in fact, was showing Turkey as a model for these aspiring democracies in every way, economically, socially, politically, and such. So I am trying to find the answer, what has changed? since, I mean, 2013 or so, that really made Turkey being perceived as such. And when I look at the domestic politics, I don't really see much of a change there. You know, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, uh, the, 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 at least the party in power, the AK party, was quite comfortable in 2013 in terms of its, you know, I mean, uh, cling on the power, as, as, as the case it, it is the now. I mean, the opposition is very much divided. Of course, they are really putting pressure on the government. But I don't think that, I mean, the government was in any way, you know, I mean, pressed hard to abuse the power that they have in order to have more or so. Because, I mean, they they have been very comfortably in the government in power for almost 10, 13 years by then. When I look at this particular time, 2012, 13, what I see was what was happening in Syria. The war in Syria, the civil war in Syria, has presented us with some very important new security threats in the form of terrorism. We had our own problem with PKK for some time, for a long period of time, but with the developments in Syria, their sister organization, PKK, sister organization, PYD, has controlled a large swath of area alongside Turkish border. Now, except for a very small pocket, the whole Turkish-Syrian border is unfortunately in the control of this organization, PYD. And of course, that changed the whole balance of our own peace process with the Kurdish communities in Turkey. I mean, the kind of deal we had with them, uh, which was a long-term deal which required much of nurturing and efforts, was unfortunately couldn't even put into force. Uh, PKK started its own attacks again in Turkey, and the government had to really think more in terms of security of our own people. Because, I mean, when you're thinking about human rights, I think the, ones, uh, the first and foremost basic human right is the right to live. And I think the government felt compelled to provide some security to its own nations against that. But then, of course, again, Daesh, which was completely new for us. I mean, PKK was at least that we know. But, I mean, uh, as the Syrian crisis evolved, Daesh, of course, had a very strong hold in Syria. Of course, I mean, that also compelled us to take some new measures, particularly in cooperation and upon the request of our Western uh, friends. Because we have been, for a few years in the beginning of this crisis, was criticized for not taking enough effective measures to stop those foreign terrorist fighters using Turkey as their way uh, to, 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 make, to find their way into Syria. And, and, and then when we started taking some measures in order to stop them, when we started in stepping up our own intelligence in the country and elsewhere, we were then told, that, I mean, no, 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 this is going too much for it. I mean, we need you to a little bit, I mean, soften your anti-terrorism approach because, I mean, this is somewhat, you know, I mean, inter uh, infringing upon human rights. And, of course, last year, the Quetem, the failed Quetem. This is what we call Fetullah Network, Fetullah Terrorist Organization, however you call it. But this was also quite a challenge for any country and for Turkey as well. Make no mistake, that was our mistake. We allowed this network, this group, this organization, whatever you call it, to come to that level. I mean, to infiltrate, to penetrate into our own state institutions and to come to that level. But in any way, last July, 15th of July, we were faced with, with what we were faced. And it was a very 
cruel sort of group uh, using power, military power, uh, against our own people. And of course, now we are in the process of trying to find those who perpetrated this coup. Not only the ones in the streets, but the ones that are controlling them, the, the ones that are supporting them. So, what we are doing now, right now really has nothing to do with the lack of commitment to democracy, democratic values, or in any way the change of government, the change of mood in the government. No, it is really a response to these new sort of you know, challenges that we are faced with, mostly security. And another thing, of course, I think this is also a matter of perception as well. Uh, the reason why Europe is also now seeing Turkey as is, is also maybe, I mean, I don't want to be sounding too simplistic, but I mean, even when in 2002, when we started the accession process with the EU, there were so many uh, skeptics about the need for that, about whether we can achieve any result. I mean, in fact, we have just recently heard Chancellor Merkel that, I mean, from the very beginning, she was not fond of you know, Turkey's EU membership process. But in any case, I think in 2012, 2013, the debate about Turkey became more costly for European politicians with the migration crisis, with the terrorism crisis. You know, I mean, pronouncing support for Turkey's membership to EU was almost a politically incorrect thing. Then, of course, I think it, was, it became convenient for many people to present Turkey as a country slipping away from democracy so as to justify the sort of the distance between Turkey and the EU. Because let's for, I mean, for the last five years, there is not one single chapter being opened or closed in terms of our EU membership process. Now, for example, if, if European countries and our Western friends and colleagues are criticizing Turkey for lack of democracy, for our violation of rule of law and human rights. There are certain very well set channels to discuss this within the accession process. There are chapters on rule of law, chapters on human rights. We are asking ourselves for the EU to open these chapters so that we can sit down, we can have a meaningful dialogue, rather than having this you know, I mean, more indirect dialogue through the press and such. So we are not shying away from a meaningful dialogue. Uh, discussing our own problems, our own shortcomings, but also with the reasons of them, with what we are doing and what is to come in the next few years. Uh, Knut, before we get into the German-Turkish relationship, could you just give us the German perspective on this broader question about human rights and, and security? Well, well, that might be a little, little bit too, too much for a couple of minutes, uh, but I can give you my personal thoughts on, on that. And talking about uh, NATO, of course, as a defense alliance, as a military alliance, I was, when I was reading uh, the, the title of our discussion, I was thinking from a practical point. So when it comes to defense and practical military action, and you are being attacked, you don't discuss with a fellow next to you, your comrade to your side, is the country where you're coming from exactly fitting to minority rights? What does your government say about LGBTI or, or, or whatever? So this is true on the front, but also in the bit of a bigger political perspective. NATO, I think, um, of course is value-based, but has always been shown a practical approach too. When I'm uh, ambassador, when we remember uh, uh, the historic uh, uh, events in, in, in your country, so Turkey stayed in NATO, even though there were military coups so and Greece. Uh, and Greece. Um, so that, that was quite practical, even though NATO is a value-based alliance. But talking about the EU, this goes much deeper and is much more complicated because we, are, we have created a common judicial sphere. More than 50% of our legislation in EU member countries is made in Brussels. So you have to be much more specific on legislation and, and values when it, when it comes to, to the EU. And this is, of course, then uh, the question, where are we now? with um, the Tur Turkish EU membership accession. So let me say, for us in Germany, and uh, certainly here in the region, Turkey is a strategic partner. It is of incredible importance for all conflicts we can see from, from here and, and, and beyond. The German-Turkish relations have traditionally been excellent. And not only uh, 
the not, not so successful military adventures in the First World War, but um, there has always been a deep respect in my country for the culture of, of, of Turkey, and so I think uh, I can say here very openly, it, I really regret where we are at, at the moment. This is not the place to discuss the, 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 the specific issues, yeah? You, you know the, the, the headlines, you know what's, what's happening, uh, you know, the arrests of German journalists and, and, and all that. Um, but the point is how do we proceed? And our um, ambassador, our um, understanding was more that we came to the conclusion that we cannot be that sure that Turkey really wants to join this union based on the existing values. And when you see all the, the critical commentaries in our media, so when you follow the, the, the politics of, of the president, policies too, um, you have questions. Is it Turkey's, because it's, we once opened up, and I know what we are discussing now about, I've listened to the, to the, to the discussion, of course, but is it still Turkey's wish to really join this European Union? Is it your wish to become just one country out of 28, 27, or even more as President Juncker uh, uh, said, said, said today. Um, and if, uh, so that, that would be my, my direct question to, to you, but I would like also to, to, uh, to, to say a word on democracies and, and defense. And, and we have seen that, of course, in Europe very tragically, in the Second, Second World War. It needs a lot to motivate the population, and we have, in fact, conscript armies still. Though the German Bundeswehr is a professional army now, the political idea of our army is a conscript army. So the former social democratic, by the way, um, uh, Minister of Defense, Struck, he invented the, the, the wonderful idea to sell our engagement in Afghanistan with the wording, Germany is defended at the Hindu Kush. But it needs a lot of argumentation to really sell that to the population. Um, secondly, we have this B Bismarck ambassador, so I'm quoting Bismarck now, with that Crimea is not worth the bones of one single Pomeranian grenadier. Yeah, so stay out. It, it, the idea was the same. I cannot motivate the, motiv my, the population to do something on, on, on Crimea. And finally, tragically to say, Murir Podanzig was also uh, hindering, hindering democratic governments to stand up against Hitler. Well, to ask this, not to put you in the hot spot, but to answer the specific question that Knut asked, um, we have about 12, I believe, German citizens in Turkish jails for what the German government says are political reasons. One, at least one, is a very famous uh, journalist for Die Welt, who's a Turkish-German citizen. Um, the way that the Turkish government has been behaving, perhaps, in terms of some human rights questions, the language that's come out from the president uh, and pro-government media institutions using the N-word to describe Nazi, to describe uh, the German government, obviously a very sensitive uh, type of rhetoric that's, that's being used. Does this Turkish government, does it want to join a community of, of values, a community of democratic values? To many people, it seems that it's not interested in that. I mean, very genuinely, I'm not acting as a diplomat here, but I mean, as a Turkish citizen, you know, I mean, educated Turkish citizen, I mean, I don't think any government can give up on our commitment to become a member of the EU. That has historical background to it, that has symbolic, cultural, political background to it. No one in Turkey can rule by, you know, I mean, openly uh, sidelining that. And this government, for a long period of time, and uh, even now, is very much committed. And they still pronounce it in no uh, unclear terms that EU membership 
remains to be a strategic objective for Turkey. This is one of the very primary goals of Turkish foreign policy. If it is a question of you trying to understand Turkey's intentions, I think the way to do it is not to pronounce, not to say that, I mean, you're going to stop negotiations with Turkey, you don't think Turkey wants to become, test us. I mean, there are ways of testing Turkey's commitment to the European Union membership. As I said, I mean, we have been accepted as a candidate country in 2004, at the very same time with Croatia. Croatia has become a member almost for many years right now. We were able to open only five or six chapters. Not one single chapter has been closed so far, even the cultural you know, I mean, uh, activities chapter. And, and those chapters, which are at the center of criticism against Turkey, rule of law, human rights, security, counterterrorism, there are, you know, I mean, very well established, you know, I mean, f uh, channels of communication that we can discuss that. Who is not opening these channels? I mean, are we, Turkey, rejecting the opening of these chapters? No. Every day, my foreign minister, my EU minister is calling on their EU counterparts open these chapters, come to Turkey, be as intrusive as you can, and let's discuss these kind of things. And then come to the conclusion whether Turkey is really not interested in becoming a EU member, or Turkey is not incapable, uh, is incapable of that we don't understand the same values in the same way. But just by looking at things from outside, that certain journalists are in jail or certain things are, I don't think this is the way to maintain a relationship which has such a background of almost 50, 60 years. We have become an associate partner of the EU in 1963 with a very visible goal of becoming a member of the EU. We have again you know, I mean, applied for EU membership in 1987, and then we were given this candidate status in 2004. And today, there are still politicians out in Europe saying that if they come to power, they're going to stop negotiations with Turkey immediately. They know that this is not possible. First of all, there is no negotiations, unfortunately, for the last many years. And it's not only up to them to stop it or to, to restart it. But still they are saying it for the convenience of their own domestic political considerations. So I don't think really the problem here is the ambiguity about Turkey's objectives and Turkey's intentions. No. I mean, I think you have to take it by the face value of what our president and prime minister are saying. That, I mean, we want to become a member of the EU. And also, I mean, it's not... I mean, I talked about symbolic and historic things, but I mean, looking at what we are faced today in the common neighborhood, terrorism, Russia, you know, I mean, migration, you know, I mean, so many other cross-boundary sort of things. I mean, I'm very much thankful to Ambassador for your very strong and convincing arguments. That, I mean, Turkey is a very important strategic partner for you. We believe, of, of course, EU is not going to crumble down without Turkey, and Turkey is not going to be the end of the world for us without the EU. But we think that, I mean, together we will be much stronger in the face of the common uh, challenges and threats. So this is, this is what I can say. With respect to journalists and such, I cannot comment on that, of course. You know, I mean, this is up to justice, the courts to make their decisions. But as a person, I am also not in favor of pretrial detentions. No, I think every person is, uh, should be given this assumption of innocence. And unless it is absolutely necessary, they shouldn't be kept in detention while their court cases are proceeding. Yes, there is a problem for that case, I mean, and we agree to it. Even, for example, yesterday, uh, one of the former ministers, just I mean, until two months ago he was a minister, and there is a very you know, I mean, important case about some of the Jumhuriyet journals. Jumhuriyet is a very you know, I mean, uh, well-established uh, I mean, uh, journal in Turkey. And he said that I mean, he doesn't approve. Uh, the decision of the court to keep them under detention for another two or three weeks. So the politicians, I mean, there are also politicians in the government who are not you know, in favor of the court decisions, but this is the court decision. And really, one should exp understand that, I mean, Turkey maybe is not fully democratic, maybe, I mean, no, one, no country is fully democratic. Democracy is something that's evolving all the time. You have to always pursue that. But I think we are definitely trying to be as democratic as we can. And, and Independence of justice is one important pillar of that. For example, when we ask to our European colleagues and, and partners what has happened for the last 10 years, there are 4,500 cases of extradition requests that we have given to one European country. Let's not name the country. It's not important really. There are so many others as well. Not one single of them have been extradited to Turkey. 
Many of them have been involved in terrorist activities, killing people. There are well-documented cases. In one other country, again, uh, in Europe, in the beginning of this year, there is a court decision saying that I mean, PKK might not be seen as a terrorist organization. That is, after all the EU decisions and everything, one court in one European country said, I mean, no, maybe PKK is not a terrorist organization. So when we ask about these cases, they are telling us that, I mean, no, justice is independent. We cannot be asked to intervene in justice for extraditing or for this. But then we are asked to either free or extradite or this. So this is kind of a double standard yeah, in that regard. There's a, there's a gentleman living in Pennsylvania in my country that I know you uh, also want I, extradited. I, I want to go there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. Tom, did you want to say something specifically? Because I have a question for you, but you can... Well, I, um, I wanted to sort of step away from the EU-Turkey uh, uh, dynamic for a moment and go back to our starting point, which is about the the relationship between security and democracy. Um, and so regardless of whether there's an EU out there and whether Turkey's current political developments are going to help or hurt that, uh, I think there's a separate discussion of, uh, to be had about the relationship. And in this region, again, uh, Georgia continues in most regards to be strengthening its democracy even while trying to address different shortcomings in its democracy in many ways. And that's where a lot of the discussion has been uh, here. As we look around the region, though, we see in neighboring Azerbaijan a country that is much more decisively moving away from democracy. What limited potential it had 10 years ago is mostly evaporated um, as the government has cracked down harder and harder on journalists, political opposition, independent civic groups. Armenia, uh, another neighbor here, is uh, kind of stagnant at best. Um, its, its democracy is not advancing, its security and prosperity also do not seem to be advancing. Um, and then Turkey. Uh, it's problematic for a number of reasons, um, but the point I want to get back to is about whether uh, a country that's democratizing or de-democratizing is going to contribute security at home and security in its neighborhood. And I think that you will find in Turkey as you confront some of these issues about how to deal with real and imagined threats from within, and I think the balance between real and imaginary threats is maybe a little different in Turkey than in some other places, uh, but we nevertheless in the United States and in the European democracies and elsewhere, we struggle a lot to find the balance of the rights of individuals who are accused of crimes and the need to establish a secure environment for our citizens, whether from terrorism or from criminals and whatever. So. Um, Turkey clearly has moved in a direction where, uh, based on not a lot of clear evidence to the observer, many thousands of people have been arrested and accused of being involved in a terrorist plot and in the coup in ways that don't seem as credible and plausible to Turkey's friends as they seem to, to some Turks. Um, one of the problems for the neighborhood, and for Georgia in particular, is that this insecurity that is mounting within Turkey driven in part by the arrests and by the campaign against uh, the Gulenists, um, accusations of many, many tens of thousands of people being part of uh, a conspiracy. Um, one of the problems of that is that that insecurity that is being felt in Turkey and being magnified in Turkey is being exported now. It's being exported to Georgia. Uh, pressure on Georgia to close down schools, to detain and extradite uh, school administrators, um, this is exporting insecurity to Georgia, just as Azerbaijan is exporting insecurity by making demands and actually apparently securing the transfer of a journalist recently. Um, these are problems for Georgia, and I think Georgia, in trying to consolidate its own movement towards democracy, needs to be mindful of not getting drawn into the insecurities that are growing in countries where their democracy is diminishing. And so um, it becomes an international issue of a different kind than EU accession or EU membership talks becomes a real security issue for a place like Georgia if the insecurities of its neighbors get transferred over here. And I think we're seeing some of that now. I don't want to focus on Turkey the entire conversation. I actually want to go back to my country because, and you know, Tom is not in government anymore so he can speak freely, but with the election of Donald Trump, we have someone who really doesn't express much concern for things like values and foreign policy and human rights. And the best, the, the closest relationships that he seems to be 
uh, developing as president thus far are with people like General Sisi, uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, king, um, Mr. Duterte in the Philippines. He likes strong men. And so I'd like to ask all the panelists, you know, what does it mean when the United States, uh, supposedly the world's greatest democracy, and which is supposed to stand for what Dan Freed calls the, the free world, what does it mean when the president of this country doesn't really seem to show any interest in promoting these values abroad? Um, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you've been talking about the US, so let me talk yes. about Europe. And, 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 the, and the chancellor was very clear. We, we couldn't, couldn't ever and today cannot take it for granted that America will do the things we expect and, uh, of America at any time. Um, she was talking about um, uh, indeed foreign policy uh, issues in, in a speech in, in Munich a couple of weeks ago. But this is our task, it's our challenge. So Europe st should, stand for, for, should stand for our values and our mission especially here in the, in the region, in Eastern Europe and, 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 beyond, and beyond. And uh, we have no, no real influence to, uh, on, on, on the president. We can tell him what we stand for and we can tell the world what we stand for. So it's, a, it's, it's also a chance for us. Yeah? Now the European Union has the possibility to lead more than before in the free world, we hope, in a, in, in, in a close, in a close relationship, but we can lead on our own. It's not just the United States. I mean, in Germany, there's a long, and certainly not the Chancellor, but there is a, uh, a pretty big strain of thinking that's, in terms of foreign policy, it's very realist, you could say, very coldly realist, say, towards Russia. And you've had this whole phenomenon of the putin versteyers the, the Russia sympathizers, uh, who don't want to talk about things like human rights in Russia. They want to just do business deals and whatnot. So this is something that is an yeah. issue in Germany yeah. as well. Yeah, but, but the, uh, the, the Chancellor is, is personally engaging in that very much. Uh, look at the press conference she was giving after uh, the last meeting we had in, in Sochi in, in early May. She, she was publicly, during the press conference, addressing the terrible fate of these, these homosexual uh, Chechens and even, the, even the, 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 the fate of Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah? So she, she is, but this is political leadership, yeah. yeah? You're completely right, and that's my favorite subject, but I think I did that already, <laughs> uh, uh, the German-Russian uh, relationship, yeah? Um, indeed, it's, it, it's, it's, it's different from here and, and different from Central European countries. Sometimes I, I would love to be Lithuanian, <laughs> frankly, yeah? But I am German, and uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, to explain that, but we can, can do that later, just ve ve very briefly I, on, on, on Turkey, because um, it's, you're, tr you're absolutely correct. Um, we, ha we are having these negotiations, open chapters, but this is the virtual world. It's, it is unreal in, 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 in a sense, because what we are facing now is um, a conflict, um, bad words on travels vice versa. So, and if we, and now we are back in Georgia, if we can't agree on a visa liberalization with Turkey for many reasons, when we are discussing travel uh, advice, right. travel warnings, yeah. yeah? So this is far from a visa liberalization. But if we cannot agree on li visa liberalization with Turkey, how can we seriously negotiate? And that, on the other hand, shows how far-reaching and important the visa liberalization for Georgia was, because this underlines, and I'm not talking about technical ways of traveling, this is an incredibly important political decision, and it was therefore that hard to reach it, I can tell you. Tom, as someone who, whose brief at the State Department was, was human rights, I mean, what do you think looking at the Trump administration eight months in? Well, we don't have enough time for me to discuss all of the potential implications of the Trump presidency for America's role in the world or America's reputation in the world. I think uh, uh, damage has been done to both of those already in nine months. Um, uh, but I'll make two points. One is that um, I think some of the rash and 
uneducated statements made by the president after he came into office have diminished the reputation of our democracy. Um, and that diminishment has been exported. To go back to my, my point, um, the, security, the NATO alliance is the bedrock of global security arrangements. It's the gold standard. And in a couple of uh, badly informed, rash statements, Donald Trump managed to undermine alliance solidarity almost overnight. He made them all anxious. He made not only countries like Georgia, which aspire to NATO, but he made uh, certainly the NATO members in the Baltic states and in Poland very anxious. They felt immediately less secure. Um, we talked earlier in the day about um, Mr. Trump's eventual uttering of the phrase Article 5 uh, against his, I mean, he had to be dragged kicking and screaming to that. Um, um, so I, I wouldn't feel much more assured if I was a frontline state than I did before he was forced at the point of a gun to make that statement. So uh, I think we've been exporting insecurity um, in parallel with the diminishment of the value of the word of the President of the United States. Uh, during my time in the State Department and in the U.S. government, what a U.S. government official said made a big difference. We spent a lot of time talking amongst ourselves about what we would say in public or say to a foreign government or say to civil society groups and countries because we thought, and I think it was true and it largely remains true, that what an American says on behalf of the United States of America matters. It has to be credible, has to be true, has to be implementable. And that's why uh, American diplomats tend to speak very carefully. Uh, they don't want to overpromise, and they don't want to under-commit. Um, so on that point, I think uh, uh, you can be assured that the American institutional governmental commitment to promoting democracy, I think, remains largely intact. We may have lost uh, a spokesman at the top, but I think we have people like Ambassador Kelly and uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Brink and uh, other U.S. officials uh, who are still on the job, still believe in the American uh, ideals and the American policies that brought us to this point where uh, global security, prosperity, and um, democracy are all interlinked, and we know that, and they know that. So I think, I mean, you can't get to be a U.S. ambassador, at least up until this year. In the last 25 years, the institutional embrace of democracy as a central tenet of U.S. foreign policy has been so deeply embedded in the State Department that it's, it has been up until January inconceivable that any American could become an ambassador to a foreign country without being able to walk and talk and, and think and dream about how he's going to push the democracy index forward in whatever country he goes to. Um, and so all those people are still out there yeah. and they're still on the job. And so I'm, I'm confident that uh, in the medium, up until the medium term, we're okay. Um, uh, notwithstanding the shortcomings at the top. Ambassador, do you think that the United States has lost some credibility when it uh, tells Turkey you should be doing X, Y, and Z on human rights issues? Do you think that it's... I, mean, I don't think, I mean, we look at who is telling us what to do. I mean, if, if the, what we are being told is the right thing to do, we take it on board. I think, I, think, I mean, U.S. and Turkey has been allies for so many years. We have seen ups and downs in our relationship, but we were able to maintain the strategic partnership because, I mean, we know that, I mean, we need each other. So we don't look at American administrations in terms of who is in power and, and no. I think, I think, you know, I mean, we know uh, what is necessary to maintain this relationship, to have a sort of a mutually reinforcing partnership in a region which is of great importance for the entire world and our role in that regard. Uh, for example, either Thomas or, I mean, Ambassador, you pointed out Turkey being a good example to Georgia and others. We definitely feel that responsibility. I mean, I don't want to over-exaggerate Turkey's influence and such, but I mean, Turkey as a predominantly Muslim country and as an important 
player in this region has a role, not only in terms of its transactional relations with the countries, but also in terms of what we are doing in our country and what it means, what it tells to our partners, neighbors, and such. So definitely, with respect to Georgia as well, we have an excellent set of relations, bilateral, technical, and such. But we also know that I mean, Georgia looks at Turkey in many respects, in terms of our democracy and such. We care in what sort of an image we radiate to, 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 to Georgia. And when it comes to that, I mean, again, I mean, I'm going to come back to Turkey thing, but I mean, uh, the ambassador pointed out real versus imaginary threats. And this is really, I mean, maybe getting the balance right is more important here than between democracy and security there. I think, I think this is the problem. I mean, what you see is as imaginary threats in Turkey is for us very real. Because, I mean, we have really gone through the, the very terrible experience of last year, 15th of July. We have seen people who have penetrated into our state institutions for decades and how they can be turned into arms and, and, and almost terrorists, really. You know, I mean, bombing uh, civilians, innocent people and such. So now, I mean, I don't think Turkish government can be criticized or accused of going after this big phenomenon which, to a certain extent, we have been a part of, of course, uh, growing, uh, making it that uh, big as well. But now I think, I mean, uh, you have to look at the process. You know, yes, thousands of people have been, uh, you know, I mean, investigated, some of them have been detained and such. But for example, I mean, only this makes the news headlines. 100,000 people have been discharged of their duties since 15th of July. Do you know how many of them have been reinstated to their works? 33,000 of them have been reinstated as of last July. So the process is going on. There is, there is a rule of law. I mean, the courts, there are special commissions set up precisely to look into these kind of things. That, I mean, we should not do mistakes. In the, so I don't think we can be criticized for going after these people. But if there are any mistakes that we are doing by over-exaggerating the threat by, by, or by violating the rule of law, then I think, I think we were more than ready to take this on board. In fact, I mean, my minister has been to Strasbourg, to Council of Europe, five times since last 15th of July, has made two major speeches to the Council of European Par Parliamentary Assembly, and we have set up a working group with the Council of Europe uh, upon the request of the Secretary General, looking into the kind of measures that we are taking, whether they are absolutely needed or not. So again, I mean, coming back to it, we are not rejecting criticism. We are not shying away from dialogue. As long as it is based on a friendly, as long as it's based on a productive sort of basis, then I think, I think we, will, we will be finding the right uh, balance in that regard. Do you want to go, please? Not, not really directly, but it, it, of course, so, so many things come to your mind. But if, if you allow me, and if I had a wish free to ex express, it would be my pledge to please explain to your president the incredible importance of the European Union, that the EU is not a Belgian version of the Soviet Union, <laughs> but, but, but the basis of peace and prosperity in, in, in Europe. This is the basic message it really needs, and we were trying when we were preparing with our Polish friends, with whom we have the one or other discussion in the last days, but we were preparing with them the visit of the, of the president. So uh, we were traveling to Warsaw and discussing, uh, and that was also our plea. Please tell him why did you join the EU and why you have no intention, and that's true for Poland, to leave it. Right. Explain the European Union in 140 characters or less, <laughs> then you can get your message across. Okay, I, I have it until dinner. <laughs> uh, I think I think we should open this up for questions. So, please show your hands. I see a, a lady on my right. Just keep talking. Hello. Yep. Hello? Just talk. Yes. Okay. My name is Deborah Wild. I'm a German freelance journalist based in Tbilisi, and my question is to the Turkish ambassador. President Erdogan recently appealed to German citizens of Turkish origin not to vote for any party in the upcoming parliamentary elections. My question is, what does that say about your commitment to democracy? If you ask people not to exercise the most fundamental duty they have is to cast a vote. And what example does that set to a country, to Georgia, where Europeans for years have said the most utmost litmus test for democracy is 
a peaceful transfer of power, and that means voting in elections. Should we take, should we take the question in groups? I think I saw a gentleman in the red sweater over here. Good evening again. Well, my name is Bacho, again. Kennedy School of Government and Practical Political School. Mr. Ambassador. Yeah. There are two ambassadors. Yeah. <laughs> I need you. I tried. I need you. Yeah. Sorry. So, the more I've studied, the more I've learned that I was persuaded that the history is impersonal. Whenever in the past 500 years there was a peace in the Middle East, it was united under Turkey. So, could some kind of new approach of Ankara can work in the region to support those newly established and fresh republics in the neighboring area? Thanks. You, you want a new Ottoman Empire, basically. Is that what you're saying? I'm <laughs> President Erdogan might actually support that. But, uh, sir? Yeah. <laughs> I failed to understand the question very well, but I mean, I'll see you. Uh, hi, my name is Malik. I am from Turkey. Uh, great to see you here. And uh, I am researcher, not diplomat. So I have to be honest. Uh, it's for intellectual reason, mind. Uh, there was a couple of uh, numbers that was going around, and Mr. Ambassador actually said 33 get back their job. But I am going to. Uh, sorry. By the way, I have two questions. Okay. Please. Uh Make yeah, it, make it short. <laughs> I am going to shock you with the numbers. After July, since uh, since 15, 2016, uh, this is a purge right after. I mean, happened after Cube last night. Those lists are prepared. When we talk about the rule of law, 146,000 people sacked from their job, 125,000 detained, 58.29 arrested, 2,000. Uh, 2,099 school dormitory and school top scientist school shut down, 8,693 academic lost day job, and we have more professor in jail right now in them than, than universities. 4,424 judges sir, persecuted, sir, sir, dismissed. Sir, is there a question? The question, yeah. coming into question. So, um, 300 journalists arrested. Yeah. And when we talk about the rule of law with the basin of the innocent until found guilty, how we will deal with the rule of law? This is my, my, my first question. And the second one, yesterday, Turkey purchasing uh, S-400 air defense missiles from Russia, how they will be implication on, uh, on, on region and also uh, some uh, neighborhood with the security, the Thank Black Sea. Thank you. Well, it seems all the questions are for the Thank you very much. So we'll let, we'll let you answer them, and then if the other panelists have... Remarks. Well, I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, first question. I mean, uh, President Erdogan asking. I mean, first of all, President Erdogan didn't ask German citizens of Turkish descent not to cast a vote. No, I mean, we didn't ask them not to exercise their most democratic right. He just recommended that. I mean, while they are casting their votes, they should be uh, recognizant of the fact that I mean, some parties are not, you know, I mean, uh, trying to build a sound relationship between Germany and Turkey. So it is not about not asking them to cast a vote, but I mean, only how to, maybe, I mean, which sort of criteria they should in mind. But then again, I mean, of course, I mean, maybe you can argue whether this is already an intervention in, the, uh, in other countries' internal affairs or not. But I mean, last April, when we had this presidential system referendum in Turkey, uh, the parties who were voting for a yes campaign, including President Erdogan, of course, were not allowed to go to Germany and to have meetings with Turkish citizens there who were going to cast their votes in, in the country because there were several uh, ballot boxes uh, opened in, in this country. Only those who were campaigning for no have been allowed to have those meetings with their uh, Turkish citizens as well. So, you know, I mean, uh, we can argue whether what President Erdogan said uh, was it uh, interference or not, but I think, I think we have to look into the general picture, and I think, I think many mistakes have been made in that regard. 
whether Turkey was willing, I, I don't know if the question is whether Turkey might be interested in building the Ottoman Empire again to reunite, and I mean, if that is the case, not at all, not at all. But if the question is about whether Turkey would like to see, or whether Turkey can live with new states in the Middle East, and I think maybe, I mean, one of the uh, things that you have in mind with the Kurdish state, maybe, because, I mean, that's what I mentioned in my uh, introductory remarks. Then, of course, I mean, it's not whether we can live with it or not, but I don't think it is the right way to uh, have stability in the Middle East. If we start dividing countries again on the basis of ethnic differences and such, there is no end to it. Just by looking at Syria, there are so many different ethnic and religious groups. And if you give the hope to them, each one and every one of them, that I mean, they can have their own state because they cannot live with their other you know, brothers and sisters because of their differences and such, then of course there is no end to it. So that's why we are very much against a Kurdish independent state in Iraq, for example. Now, Farzani, for example, is going to hold a referendum for independence on the 25th of September, and I think Turkey is not alone in that regard. US, EU, and all the other, of course, international players also have cautioned against, because this is not timely, this is not the way to do it in, in a unilaterally, only it should be made in a sort of a more peaceful and politically acceptable way. Um, about the S4, I'm not going to go into details of the statistics. I mean, I can also come up with so many statistics. What I said in my remarks, I think, was quite enough in that. S400, there is, of course, a background to it. I mean, yes, I mean, uh, one can discuss that for long hours. Technically, whether it is the right decision, whether a NATO ally can have S400 missiles. Now, I, as far as I know, Greece has S300 missiles. An earlier version of that has already been deployed in uh, Greek territories, especially in the island of Crete, if I'm not wrong. So it's not going to be the first time. But we didn't want to do that. Our first option was not either China, as we did uh, two years ago, I guess, and then we cancelled the uh, contract at that. We wanted to have one of our allies in NATO to provide it. And that's why, I mean, this negotiations, this tender took so much time. It's been going on for now five years. We definitely need these missiles. Intermediate, you know, I mean, uh, missile defense uh, equipment, we need it. But you know what I mean? We want also not to be given that or sold, but we want to share technology. We want to be able to rely on these you know, I mean, systems for the foreseeable future. Because I mean, every now and then, you have to improve, you have to modernize. Yeah. So that's why I mean, we want to share the technology behind it as well. And only, unfortunately, Russia provided that with so much you know, I mean, less costly terms. So that's why uh, it's, it has nothing to do with our lack of commitment to our alliance uh, goals and objectives, but it was really a sort of a long negotiation based on its merits. Do you have any uh, response to the I, issue I, about... I, I, I've seen a quote of uh, the Turkish Prime Minister today. I, I think it was the Prime Minister saying, um, let's use the time after the German elections. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that all these very serious developments and our serious discussion on the serious questions is just election campaign. They, it, is, it, is very, it is very serious. But let me take that from a positive side. And uh, quoting the title of our, our panel here, um, let's get, get things in order or get the balance right uh, again. And maybe we have a window which opens um, this fall, um, I think it's, it's in the interest of your country, of Europe and NATO and the wider region, because the, the state in which we are is, is, is terrible and we have to overcome that. Tom, do you have anything to add? Or? Uh, no, I'd just finish by um, returning a bit to where I began by saying that uh, non-democracies tend to become incubators of insecurity. Uh, in various dimensions, uh, and we see that in this neighborhood. Uh, and I would say to the Georgians here, who are net exporters of security and the more, most democratic now in the region, uh, that they should be mindful of the flip side of the coin of international solidarity, which means that Georgians need to be mindful of their obligation to also be a, a defender of democracy and individual activists uh, in neighboring countries as well and look for opportunities to demonstrate that kind of international democratic solidarity when the tough choices are presented by extradition warrants or other transactions. On that note, uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time, so thank you all for a very spirited conversation. Uh, and
Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> thank you, the, the panel. Thank you, Ambassador. I'll take the liberty of being the moderator to add my two cents on the whole thing, which is that I hope all of our countries can do more than one thing at a time. I think we can disagree about some issues, and we can also focus on some other strategic issues that we have to deal with at the same time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jamie, for moderating. We're going to call up our.